Hi, this is Joe Chaffin. Before we get started with episode 080, I wanted to let those of you who are parents know that we'll be discussing in this interview high-risk activities for HIV in a non-graphic way, but if that's something you're not comfortable with your children hearing, you might want to listen to this one in your headphones. Just a word to the wise. Thank you and enjoy the episode. Hello, this is Dr. Mindy Goldman from Canadian Blood Services in Ottawa, and this is the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 080CE of Blood Bank Guy Essentials, the podcast designed to teach you the essentials of transfusion medicine. My name is Joe Chaffin, and I am your host. Today on the podcast, I want to give you a behind-the-scenes look at how blood collection organizations make really difficult decisions designed to keep their blood donors and the people who will receive the blood that they collect safe. In an interview with Dr. Mindy Goldman from Canadian Blood Services. But first, you should know that this is, in fact, a continuing education episode. The free continuing education credit is provided by transfusionnews.com, and Transfusion News is brought to you by BioRad, who has no editorial input into the podcast. This podcast offers a continuing education activity where you can earn several different types of credit, including one AMA PRA Category 1 credit, one contact hour of ASCLS PACE program credit, or one American Board of Pathology self-assessment module, or SAM, for continuing certification. To receive credit for this activity, to review the accreditation information and related disclosures, please visit www.wileyhealthlearning.com slash transfusion news. Now with that bit of housekeeping out of the way, you should be aware, and I hope you are, that blood collection organizations wrestle constantly with two big questions. The first, of course, is how can I keep these amazing blood donors safe? We really have to make rules and decisions about who can and can't donate blood, in that case from the perspective of keeping donors from being harmed by what's really an incredibly generous act, giving blood. But the second question is probably what came to your mind when I first started talking about safety, and that's this one. How can I protect the patients who are going to receive the blood that I'm collecting? We ask our donors, as you know, an incredible array of spectacularly detailed and really, really personal questions, and we're trying to find out things that might put them at higher risk of passing on a transfusion transmitted infection to a patient. So in today's episode, I'm joined by Mindy Goldman, who's the Medical Director of Canadian Blood Services, or CBS in Canada, obviously. Mindy and I are going to pull back the curtain on how some of these tough decisions are made and when we discuss two real world examples. First, we're going to talk about Canadian Blood Services' decision to discontinue the use of an upper age limit for their blood donors and how Dr. Goldman and Health Canada decided that their blood, older blood donors would be safe. And second, and somewhat more controversially, we're going to walk through the more recent decision to change the deferral for males who have had sex with other males from one year down to three months. So let's just be honest with each other, okay? I realize that second issue is one that brings up really strong feelings, no matter how you feel about it. I know that some believe strongly that men who have had sexual contact with other men should never donate blood, and others are okay with a timed deferral after male-to-male sexual contact, like a year or three months, while some believe that the entire thing is unfair and discriminatory. And I want to be clear, this interview is not meant to be anything but educational. I was interested in the discussion and the why behind the decision, and I welcome respect respectful, and I do mean respectful, discussion in the comment section at bbguy.org slash 080. And again, I do mean respectful if you get my meaning. Before we start, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Goldman. Mindy is the Medical Director of Donor and Clinical Services at Canadian Blood Services in Ottawa, Canada, and she's an adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa. Mindy's a clinical hematologist with extra training in transfusion medicine, and throughout her career, Mindy has focused on evaluation and implementation of donor eligibility policies to ensure safety for both patients and donors, kind of what we're talking about today. And one of her main areas of interest for recipient safety has been the evaluation and evolution of deferral policies for men who have had sex with other men. Mindy is currently on the board of directors of the ISBT, and she's active in many international professional societies, including AABB, as well as the BEST Collaborative. Mindy is a frequent contributor to the medical literature 
And with Dr. Ann Etter, she is a co-editor of the a really, really great book from AABB Press called Screening Blood Donors with the Donor History Questionnaire. Okay, let us go. Here's my interview with Dr. Mindy Goldman. Is that donor safe? Hi, Mindy. Welcome to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast. Nice to be here. It's wonderful to have you. I really appreciate you doing this, Mindy. Well, for a lot of reasons. I think it's really important and very, very interesting to talk about, first, differences in perhaps how things are done and how decisions are made in Canada as compared to where the majority of my audience is listening from the U.S., but also to talk about a couple of really, really important decisions slash evaluations that you guys have made recently up there in Canada that I think impacts really all of us in the blood world. So as we get started, Mindy, I wonder if you would take us through a little bit how blood is supplied, collected, processed in Canada, in particular in comparison to how things happen in the United States. Could you just give us a a high level overview of that, please? Sure. So things are not that different north of the border, uh, but uh, we have two blood suppliers in Canada, Canadian Blood Services and Hema Quebec. The organizations were founded in 1998, after the Creever report of shortcomings in the system, when it was run by the Canadian Red Cross and thousands of Canadians were infected with HCV and HIV. And so really the organizations were founded in a very precautionary principle sort of way. Canadian Blood Services was responsible for blood collection, testing and distribution for all the provinces and territories except for Quebec. And Hema Quebec, as you might guess, is responsible for doing that for the province of Quebec, which is about 25% of the population in Canada. So these are independent organizations. They're arm's length from government. They have their own boards of directors. However, they are funded mainly by the provincial governments. And the provinces fund according to the blood use in their province. And then uh, blood is distributed and blood comes components to the hospitals according to their needs. We also collect a little bit of source plasma and we purchase and distribute plasma protein products to uh, all the hospitals as well. And we do some work in organs and tissues and we're responsible for the unrelated stem cell registry in Canada and have a Canadian cord blood bank. So if you look at the blood side, we collect about 825,000 whole blood units a year at Canadian Blood Services. Most of our platelets are whole blood derived using the Buffy coat method, so that's a little bit different from the U.S. We do collect some apheresis, but most are Buffy coat platelets. Mindy, in the United States, as as I think most of our listeners will be aware of, there is an overriding government authority, in particular the Food and Drug Administration, and a lot of blood banks and blood centers in the United States are also either voluntarily or where I live in California by law, regulated also by the AABB. How does that fit in in Canada? Do you have an overriding government organization? We do. We do. So our equivalent of the FDA is Health Canada. There are regulations leader for both CBS and Hema Quebec. A little nuance compared to the FDA is that we need to submit to our regulator most proposed changes, any proposed change that might affect recipient health has to be submitted to the regulator prior to implementation. So that's a bit different than in the U.S. I think because we're just two blood suppliers, they're able to do it that way. That does not apply for our diagnostic labs and sort of the non-core business, but for the blood components and so on, that all has to be cleared with the regulator before we can make a change. So if we're talking about a change, a typical change, which is not dealing with an emergent issue, which is a little different. You know, requests for changes can come in from everywhere. They can be things that people in the field or staff say this is unclear or do we really need to do things this way? We get complaints from donors that are being deferred. Why am I being deferred? Nowadays, everyone looks at websites from other organizations 
lot of Canadians go south in the winter and they donate blood in the States <laughs> and they challenge us. How come I was able to donate in Florida and I'm not able to donate here? It's <laughs> a good question. Right. Um, <laughs> and obviously we ourselves go to meetings and learn from our colleagues and think, gee, could we do something a bit better here? You know, requests for change or thinking about change comes in in many different directions. We have a donor selection criteria working group, which uh, is an advisory group that puts together people from Canadian Blood Services and Hema Quebec. It includes both operational people from our collections group, as well as quality and regulatory affairs, medical people, of course, both in the field and at head office, our infectious disease specialists. We have a donor representative and a recipient representative on the committee. And so often requests for change will start there. And we will think about what we've been asked to do and what kind of data we might have or information we might need to make the change. We have a strong epidemiology group. And so often this might mean evaluating some of the data that we have in our donors or maybe a study that we need to do to get more data to ensure that what we're doing is the right thing. Uh, We often will reach out to international colleagues to see what their data is, what they're doing and if they performed any studies to assess the safety and efficacy of what they're doing as well. So it's not Mindy sitting on the throne waving her magic wand and saying, this must change. Well, that might be the start. Certainly, I sometimes feel like I'm the complaints department. (laughs) (laughs) With everybody from, you know, donors who've just come back from Florida to members of parliament wondering why they're deferred. Uh, But then if there is no magic wand, I'm not the good witch. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I wasn't implying that. Oh, man. Now I feel badly. All right. <laughs> well, Minnie, that's thank you for sharing that. I wonder if we could talk just a little bit about uh, overriding goals. We're going to get into a couple of very specific things that you guys have evaluated recently there in Canada and you've made some decisions on. But before we get there, I think it's important to set the stage a little bit. And this is certainly universal, whether you're collecting in the United States or the UK or Canada or wherever around the world. When we are considering the criteria, for example, that we use to screen our blood donors for acceptability, whether they're physical criteria, whether they're other criteria that we'll refer to, what are our overriding goals? What are we trying to do when we put in these criteria, either, again, behavioral-based or physical criteria-based or age-based? What are we trying to do with that? Well, I think the two overriding bedrock goals have got to be recipient safety and donor safety. So the whole reason we're doing all this is obviously to provide a safe blood component to a patient, and we have to always keep that in mind. Donor safety has become a more important issue lately, and in terms of a lot of the changes that we do, they might impact on donor safety as well. So those are the two kind of, I think, basic tenets uh, to think about everything. There are a lot of other kind of areas that are also important in terms of blood availability, for example, you can have a very safe donor, but if that's the only donor, that's not going to work. So there's always, you know, we're not an academic institution. It's, we have to, to meet our quotas. Blood availability is an important part of safety. And a lot of things feed into availability, right? Sort of donor satisfaction. We're entirely dependent as are people in the US and many other countries on a on a volunteer blood supply so donors will walk with their feet they don't like uh, they're not comfortable with what they're asking <laughs> us they think it's too long it's too invasive they feel that we are discriminatory organization etc so so there are a lot of things that feed into availability and then obviously operational efficiency is important too because we're all trying to do the best we can with scarce dollars and uh, make improvements Movements in our system, often with budgets that are not expanding. So trying to be more efficient and make the best of the healthcare dollars that are available to us. 
I think what you just said is is so important for the learners that are listening to this to understand. And it, yeah, absolutely, keeping the donor safe, keeping the, the patient safe, but also being able to strike the balance of not making the criteria so restrictive that we don't have any donors left is, I think, something that learners miss sometimes. And with that in mind, I would love to take a couple of recent evaluations that you guys have done, as I mentioned, up there in Canada, and just break them down a little bit. So let's talk first about the one that is maybe a little less controversial, and that is whether or not there should be an upper age limit to people donating blood, whether older donors are acceptable and or just as safe as younger blood donors. So, Mindy, you evaluated this along with the BEST Collaborative in a paper that was published in April 2019 in Transfusion, by the way, and that paper was called Safety of Blood Donation by Individuals Over Age 70 and Their Contribution to the Blood Supply in Five Developed Countries, a BEST Collaborative Group Study. Mindy, I wonder if you'd talk us through a little bit what led you to be interested in that paper and and further, what's the history in in Canada of having an upper age limit with blood donors? The history is that we, like many other blood suppliers, had an upper age limit. We had some pretty complicated criteria, actually. So the upper age limit was the lowest for first-time donors. At one point, I think it was as, as low as 61 or 62, which seems ridiculously young now since I'm in hailing <laughs> distance. <laughs> um, and um, then for for regular repeat donors, which we had a complicated definition for that. You had to have donated, I think, in the last, successfully donated in the last two years. It was a little bit higher, maybe 66. And then uh, if you were a regular donor, so you were donating regularly, successfully, I believe we dropped you when you hit your 71st birthday. So the impetus for change came from a few areas. Uh, The first is we actually had a lot of donors dropping off the edge of that demographic uh, uh, criteria because our whole donor base, our whole population in Canada, as in a lot of other uh, developed countries, is aging. And so we had quite a few donors who were just being kind of booted uh, just because they hit that age limit. And then, as I mentioned, a lot of these people um, head to Florida in uh, in the winter months, and they would successfully donate there. And so we did get a lot of complaints from these donors, a lot of them very dedicated, you know, multi-gallon donors saying, I successfully donated in Florida, and now here I am back in BC. And by the way, this is me winning the marathon in my age group uh, with a picture from the local (laughs) newspaper. And uh, why can't I donate blood here? Sure. It seemed like a good question. (laughs) Um, (laughs) To which I really didn't have a great answer. So then uh, comes the question of if you want to assess a change, how are you going to get data to support it? Well, one thing is to look at experience in other jurisdictions. And to us, that was mainly the U.S. They were really the only place that had either removed the upper limit or had a much higher upper limit. And there were some studies that had been published there. And I also tried to get information from all of my friends and colleagues about what they were doing and how they thought it was working. Uh, The other is to look if you have any exceptions to your rules that maybe you can learn from. So at the time, we had a large autologous donor program, as did a lot of other people. And uh, a lot of those donors were pretty elderly. They had many pre-existing medical conditions, um, and they were on a lot of medications, sometimes uh, hobbling into the clinic on their cane at the age of 85 because they were going to have their third hip replacement done. And they tolerated donation rather well. So we looked at the, you know, the reaction rate in those donors, which was very low, and we were able to convince our regulator, putting together the U.S. experience, our experience with our autologous donors, and a few papers published about the way older uh, adults adjust to hypovolemia. There is a literature on that to convince the regulator that we could increase the upper age limit. At first, we just could do it for these 
regular repeat donors, and we had to send them to get a uh, permission slip from their physician. <laughs> the same way oh, when wow. you miss school, you know, uh, mm-hmm. I was out <laughs> sick. So this was, I'm not <laughs> sick. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, although, mm-hmm. of course, those physicians don't really know that much about our criteria. But we did do that at first, and then we had a look at the results of that after a year or two of doing that, and we were able to show uh, Health Canada that there were the donors that were deferred from donation, we would have deferred them anyway by our usual questionnaire, and so it really was not useful, and it was an extra step for the donor, so we were able to get rid of it. And then once we gained our own experience and evaluated what was happening in those repeat donors, we were able to gain some courage and drop the upper age limit even for our first time donors or the irregular donors. So sort of a gradual process as we learned ourselves looking at our own data in Canada. Minnie, I think that sets the background really well. Why don't we move ahead in time a little bit to when you were involved with this best collaborative paper and If you could, just set the stage for the paper. Who was involved? What were you trying to look at? What were your goals of that study? So the best group is uh, Biomedical Excellence for Safer Transfusions. And so it brings together a group of scientists, physicians, researchers, and manufacturers to try and pull what we could do together to enhance the uh, safety and efficacy of what we're offering, which is mainly our fresh blood components, a little bit about also hospital transfusion practices and diagnostic services. And so in that group, there's a range of people who have upper age limits for donation. We had done an initial study where we just looked at the demographic characteristics of our general population in our countries and then of our donor population trying to answer the question about is our donor population aging and if so is it aging faster than our general population because of course looking forward uh, we're trying to see how we're going to maintain the adequacy of the blood supply when uh, one person in five is getting a seniors discount in Canada (laughs) (laughs) So, so that study Uh, highlighted the differences in the upper age limit for donation in many countries and also that individuals over 65 were a very fast growing segment of the general population in many of our countries, which is a good thing. No, and a lot of these people are very healthy. And so uh, that kind of gave the idea, well, why don't we look more closely at what we're doing on the donor end? And I remembered my days trying to change our policy. And one thing I have noticed is that once people have kind of fought their battle and changed their policy, they don't necessarily publish their findings and they just go on and attack their next challenge. Right. Right. And so (laughs) that's great on them, but it it doesn't really help other jurisdictions that haven't changed uh, look to a nice evidence basis on which to base changes in their policies. So as somebody who's always kind of on the outlook for nice studies that I can then uh, send along to Health Canada, I thought that this would be interesting. I also thought that we would probably come up with a better data set and more solid conclusions by looking at a few different different countries that all have sort of different criteria for health considerations because a lot of medical conditions obviously become more common as people get older and policies are quite different in different countries about people who have diabetes and are in, on insulin or you know with type 2 diabetes or people who have heart disease or all those kinds of things so it, it would be more robust if we pulled the data from a few different countries so that's what we did in the study um, we didn't really want to compare reaction rates or different 
referral rates between countries because we know that these are very difficult to compare because of different definitions, different criteria, different ways of gathering the data. So we decided what would be more valid would be for each country to look at the reactions and the deferrals in their older donors compared to their 24 to 70 year old donors. Why not include the youngest donors? Well, we all know that those donors have the highest reaction rates and they make up a variable percentage of the blood supply in each country and the lower age limit is different in different countries. So that's why we came up with that study design. We invited all best members who don't have an upper age limit and were part of kind of large blood centers to participate. And there were five countries, um, quite a few more centers participating than that. And uh, I think we came up with quite quite a nice data set showing that at least in repeat donors, it's very safe to continue donating. And these older donors will donate more often than the younger donors and uh, are probably the cheapest recruits that you'll find because they've you know, they've drunk the Kool-Aid and are eating the cookies and they're very loyal supporters of the blood (laughs) system usually. Um, So obviously they're a selected group of the older population, but uh, they're very dedicated and loyal. And I know that since that paper has been published, I don't want to totally attribute this to the paper, but I know that several other countries in Europe have increased their uh, upper age limit. To me, that's like winning the lotto. You know, that's very gratifying (laughs) if you think, wow, something that we could do in Canada or in this group could then help others make an informed decision on what to do for their donors to best serve their patients. So that's like jackpot. So going back to that balance that we talked about in the beginning, Mindy, I assume that your conclusion from looking at the the information in this paper, as well as your personal experience, is that this is that the balance is not swinging too far towards a lack of safety if you allow older donors to donate. Is that an accurate statement? It is. I mean, we did put in the discussion in the paper that most of these donors are repeat donors. <laughs> so rare is the, you know, first time donor who's over age 70. Sure. Um, and so that's not a deferral in in most of these countries that participated for most of the blood centers, we talked about if we could split out that data. But unfortunately, we thought that most of the first time donors in that age bracket would be more first time to that blood center, you know, people Mm -hmm. who saw the light and, um, you know, failed on (laughs) Vermont and now live in Arizona kind of first time donors, (laughs) Um, rather than true first timers. And so I I think the data is probably weaker for actual first timers and they are rare. There's the odd one, you know, that would be my only caveat there. Otherwise, for people who have previously donated, who meet the criteria, I think it's it appears to be a very safe thing to do. Let us move on to a topic that is a little more fraught with controversy. And this is a topic when we talk about deferrals for men who have had sex with men. This is a topic that is, as I said, fraught with with strong feelings, with, in many cases, with a lot of emotion simply that has gone into this entire discussion over the years. It's a very big deal. And I think it's very important to understand that we do our very best in blood center world to handle this with as much sensitivity and kindness and grace as we possibly can, but it's a difficult thing to address. So we want to take you through a little bit how things have gone internationally and specifically how Mindy and her group in Canada have have addressed this recently? Definitely. I mean, when you get into a criterion that on the one hand um, has been critical in the past for recipient safety, right? Before we had testing for HIV, this criterion was very important in blood safety. And on the other hand, from a societal perspective, seems to be excluding a whole group of people 
based on their sexual orientation, um, a group that has been stigmatized and discriminated. Uh, in other areas, you, you can see that the setup is, is going to be for difficult, difficult decisions and, uh, and difficult to make progress on criteria changes. Absolutely. Well, Mindy, you've you've written about this uh, in particular in an article in Vox Sanguinis in 2018. Perhaps we should start with just a general look at what strategies blood centers, blood collectors use, both screening and testing, to try and keep the blood supply safe from HIV. Yeah, so we're a very uh, safety conscious industry, and that, uh, of course, comes out of partly because of the health tragedy in the 80s, uh, where so many recipients became infected with HIV and hepatitis C. And, you know, in Canada, the Creever report did raise issues where we could have done things better, been more rapid at introducing testing and changing criteria. That could have avoided some of this suffering and hardship that we caused. And so I think that's true in every country that with the HIV and so-called non-A, non-B hepatitis, with your younger, younger listeners will not have a clue, but that was what we call hepatitis <laughs> C before we knew what Indeed, it was. Yes. You know, that is kind of the background environment of the 80s when the criteria were first put in place where gay men at first were noticed to be a high-risk group for AIDS. Um, and so criteria were put in place to defer first gay men with multiple partners because that was clearly a high-risk group. And then once testing for HIV started, it was noted that even men with just one sexual encounter with another male were at a high risk group. Uh, and so that's when the FDA and followed by many other regulatory agencies put in that even once since 1977 deferral. And, you know, in a regulated environment, um, it's difficult to make changes in, in uh, criteria, especially when they come from that kind of background. And there was a paper from Dr. Mike Bush showing that that criterion did make a difference in the epidemic in the U.S. and San Francisco and decreased transmission of HIV before testing was put in place. So clearly, before testing was in place, and probably when there was first generation testing and just antibody testing, right? This criterion was important in maintaining blood safety. So, you know, at the present time, we have several layers of safety. I think, first of all, we have to recognize that safety begins before people come to donate with public health education, people being able to easily access HIV testing, not coming to the blood center in a test seeking mode, and knowing themselves so that if they're in certain risk groups, they should not come in to donate. Then when people come in or they look at our website and they're thinking of donation, we all have information in our mandatory pamphlets that people are supposed to read explaining what high risk groups are, what our definition of sex is, what the window period is, and why um, uh, people should not come in to donate or not donate if they are in these risk groups. Um, obviously, all our questionnaires have many questions getting at HIV risks. And one of them is about men having sex with men or for women having sex with a male who's had sex with another male. And then our testing is now improved tremendously. And we are all doing two tests for HIV. So both antibody testing and NAT testing for nucleic acids. And so our window period when somebody might be infected but not picked up on our tests has become very small probably in the order of less than a couple of weeks. So that's kind of the background of where we're at in terms of trying to then think about criteria changes. I wonder if you would take us a little bit through the history of how you have done 
deferrals for males having sex with males in Canada. You mentioned in the mid 80s that Health Canada followed the recommendation from the US FDA to give a permanent deferral for any male who had had sex with a male even once since 1977. When did that change? And what were the stages that you went through in Canada? And we'll get into the details in a minute. And where are you now? Yeah, so for many years, that did not change at all. There was a lot of social activism on uh, university campuses with ban the ban campaigns, Mm -hmm. sometimes boycott of clinics to try and and put pressure on Canadian blood services and the same thing for for Hema Quebec to change our criterion. And of course, testing had evolved considerably and was continually improving. We did have a court case, which we, uh, under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada, that we were being discriminatory. Uh, we did kind of win, quote unquote, the court case, although the judge did say that it was that we had not proven that we needed to maintain the length of the deferral period, the ever increasing length of the deferral period. And that's not really what the what the case was really focused on but so given given that and given the goal of being more inclusive to have the minimum number of deferrals uh, both people who were being deferred because they were ineligible and also people who we would uh, have accepted to donate but who were kind of allies and social justice advocates this is mainly young people of course just not wanting to to donate in support of people who they thought were being unfairly discriminated against. So we started having meetings um, that included both patient groups uh, that needed a high... A number of transfusions, so the Canadian Hemophilia Society, uh, Canadian Thalassemia Society, Sickle Cell Anemia, um, and um, advocacy groups in Canada, um, AGAL Canada, uh, various other other uh, student groups, and so on, and trying to get these people together in the room, often with an external facilitator, to have discussions about um, what we were doing in the in the blood supply at the time, what we thought the risks were, uh, what possible changes could be made. And some of these were um, at con- some of this was in a consensus conference that was published in the early 2000s. And these were very difficult meetings, difficult conversations, very polarized um, and uh, not very successful at finding any kind of a middle ground. Uh, it was clear to us that we were not going to be able to change the criteria with the regulators since uh, we didn't really have any data um, to show that it would be safe. Of course, when you're again, when you're not doing something, you're not going to get any data. And we clearly did not have the support of uh, anybody to, to move forward in any way. So what changed over time was uh, Australia uh, went to a 12-month deferral. Um, Our testing improved still further. I think society um, expectations and um, understanding uh, improved. We did uh, surveys in our donors that showed that many donors uh, thought that we should accept um, uh, men who had sex with men, providing that they were safe or if they met all of their criterion. I mean, exactly what that's supposed to mean. You can say, well, that's not all that clear. But the donors were clearly open to a different way of doing things and did not think that there should be a lifetime deferral uh, for for men who had sex with men. Um, and so we, we uh, started to uh, try and make changes. We again uh, pulled together groups. Um, so stakeholder participation has always been really vital in this. And um, this time we were able to get more agreement that a permanent deferral was not necessary and we could move to a shorter deferral period uh, based on window period for HIV modeling of risk that was done in Canada and in the US and UK of what would happen if we changed our criteria, uh, the experience of Australia. 
And so we were able to move to a five-year deferral. Uh, why five years? I think there was still concern by recipient groups and the regulator about emerging threats. And that may be men who have sex with men would be a high risk group for emerging pathogens, just as HIV had been an emerging threat uh, in the 80s. Um, so as we went on, emerging threats, you know, they came up in uh, gardeners who uh, weren't wearing long sleeves and caught West Nile virus or people who traveled to exotic climes uh, and so on. And clearly, did did not have sexual routes of transmission as their main um, transmission route. Our testing improved still further. Uh, we did not have any increase in HIV uh, in our donors when we moved to a five-year deferral, showing that all the modeling um, had actually been very conservative. So using the same type of logic, both heavy input from high interest groups, patients and community groups, as well as risk modeling, analysis analysis of our own epidemiology and what happened in other countries who changed their uh, criteria, we were able to move from a five-year deferral to a one-year deferral and finally recently to a three-month deferral for men who have sex with men. There's a lot in there that we could talk about and, and go further into, but in the interest of time, perhaps we should step back just a little bit um, and we'll come back to your three month decision and, and how that entire process went. But before we do that, I think that you've pointed out in previous things that you've written that there are several ways to look at options for deferrals for men who have had sex with other men. And I wonder if you would just take the time to, to take us through those three main options, in particular, the first two, the time-based deferral and the risk activity-based deferral. Could you take us through kind of the pros and cons of both of those and your views on how both of those have come about? Sure. So the time-based deferral is basically what we've just been talking about, and that is a pretty blunt instrument <laughs> uh, where it's just if uh, a male has had sex with another male, then uh, he will be deferred for a time interval since the last sexual contact. And then as the testing has improved and so on, the time interval has shrunk. <laughs> The advantage to this is that it has proved very safe. We're very familiar with this approach and we've made all these other changes using this approach. The disadvantage is that you're still deferring uh, any really sexually active gay man and you are not allowing people who may be in a very low risk group, for example, people who have one partner and are in a stable monogamous relationship for years from donating. Mm -hmm. So that is the problem with that approach. There is a limit to it when you feel that you're getting pretty close to the window period, plus a little bit of leeway, right? So, so that's the time-based approach. And Mindy, before, before you move on from that, can I ask one question that I get asked a lot? When the U.S. went to the one-year deferral for males who have had sex with other males, one of the questions that several of the physicians at my hospitals asked me was, do we have any idea of whether or not there's complete honesty about how people are answering those time-based deferral questions now? Is there any data out there about that? So it's hard to get at, at that kind of data. The way that organizations have tried to get at it is uh, mainly by doing anonymous donor surveys. Uh, looking at people who have recently successfully donated and asking them the same questions or similar questions that should have led to their deferral at the time of donation. So uh, doing that, those are called compliance surveys. Doing that, we see that the compliance rate is very good in our donors of the order of 99% and that there are a small number that are not compliant with our criteria for MSM. So it is very reassuring in that the vast majority of donors appear to be answering truthfully. The other way that you can look at it is look at the donors that are coming up HIV positive, right? And mm -hmm. interviewing those donors and finding out, are those people who should have been deferred? And sometimes they are, but I have to say in Canada, there's a very small number with from zero to five HIV positive donors a year out of, you know, between uh, Canadian lead surfaces and Hema Quebec, over a million donations screened. So that's also an indicator that very high risk people are not coming in to donate. 
Okay, so let's let's move on to the risk activity based questions. And I think I said earlier that this is in a way something that a lot of people wish that we would be able to get to where donors are asked about specific activities. Could you give us your perspective on that type of questioning and how feasible it is? Yeah, so that type of questioning is a much more nuanced approach than a yes, no answer. It's not the typical approach that we use uh, to do any kind of donor assessment, to be honest. So if you look at our questionnaire, it does tend to be uh, yes, no answers, and it does not tend to be more nuanced risk assessment. And that goes for criterion related to VCJD risk. We don't accept people who are vegan, uh, even if you know, they just insist they didn't eat any meat when they lived in the UK and, right. and on and on. So that's not our usual, but it is more nuanced um, and it can be done in a number of ways. One way would be to still have a a capture question about males having sex with males in a given time period. And then if the answer is yes, trying to drill down with other questions to get a safe subset of people who would be allowed to donate. Another way, the so-called gender neutral way, is to ask all donors questions to try and get at deferral of those with a high risk sexual partner or high risk sexual behavior, not uh, making the distinction of whether the partner is a same sex or opposite sex partner. So uh, the type of questions that could be asked in either way would be our questions about, and it's always in a given time period, you're still focusing on a time period, but it could be asking the donor if they've had a new partner, if they've had more than one partner, if they feel that they and their partner are in an exclusive relationship. Those are the types of questions. And they're not really an individual risk assessment because you're still grouping people in categories and it's not really true from a risk perspective that a new heterosexual partner in Canada has the same risk of HIV as a new male partner for a male, Um, but it is a more nuanced approach and it certainly has a certain appeal to it in sounding like a more fair approach uh, rather than any MSM and you're, you're being deferred for a period of time. So Mindy, that sounds reasonable and it sounds logical. Is anyone actually doing this anywhere in the world? Yes, these gender neutral approaches are used in Italy and in Spain. They do have quite different blood systems than we do in North America, however. So they're using physicians to screen the donors, probably allowing for more nuanced questioning and risk assessment. As you know, we use screeners, but we're not asking extra questions of the donors. If you look at their results, uh, they have not published national data, but what they have published shows a higher rate of HIV in their donors and more donors donors that are positive only by nucleic acid testing, so recent infections, than we see in North America. And so the system is different, so hard to directly transpose to our system. Okay. Well, and like the time-based deferrals, uh, I know that you've written and talked before about the the relative strengths and weaknesses of the risk activity-based deferrals. Could you talk to us about that? What are the good and maybe not so good or more challenging things about assessing things on a risk activity based manner? Well, I think I've pointed out the weakness that it may not afford the same degree of safety for recipients, at least as performed in Italy and Spain. Um, In terms of adequacy of supply, if you ask these questions to all donors, so if you do do a gender neutral approach, you could be losing a lot of very safe donors because these are not rare activities. And so I think you have to look um, more in a more detailed way at that side of things in terms of the specificity of the question is is very low, right? And you will be losing a lot of currently donating um, safe donors. So I think it's hard to just transpose what's happening there and say, well, why don't we do 
the exact same thing here. It doesn't mean that one could develop a more nuanced approach, but it's hard to just do a cut and paste of something that's currently out there. I hear what you're saying. I mean, I think that the idea, of course, is that doing things that way has the potential to gain back the gay men who are in monogamous, steady relationships with another. In theory, anyway, that seems like that would be a fairly safe group of men. And I think that's been the concern that that has been expressed in that population is that we're discriminating against those in monogamous relationships, but it doesn't come without some potential other complications. Is that a, a fair way to interpret it? I think it is. And it could be that the first way that this will be implemented is with an additional manufacturing step that would ensure safety. So, for example, with a quarantine on plasma or with a processing of plasma uh, in a source plasma situation or with pathogen reduction with platelets. And so there would be an extra step that would be there uh, in addition to all the things that we're currently doing to ensure safety. So, Mindy, just in the interest of time, as we close our close out our time together, I wanted to give you the chance to talk through a little bit. As you mentioned, you very recently, at the time of this recording, it's just been a couple of months. So in June of 2019, Canada moved to a three-month time-based deferral for males who have had sex with other males. So I wonder if you just share with us as as we finish this, what kind of reception has that change received? Has there been resistance on either side, either from the perspective of the donor safety side or the, well, primarily from this recipient safety? side. Has there been any pushback to that? And how do you plan to monitor going forward how well this is going for you? So in terms of recipient groups, we really included them in the whole process of modifying the criteria. And many of them wrote letters of support to our regulator, Health Canada, agreeing to show that they agreed with the change, as did uh, MSM advocacy groups. So they knew this was coming. They were part of the process, and we have not had any kind of negative feedback from them. In terms of MSM groups, LGBT, LGBTQ advocacy groups. I mean, for them, this is maybe a step in the right direction, but obviously not where they want to end up. So we're continuing to work with them in many research studies. Federal government has given a lot of money to do more research projects to try and move to a more nuanced risk-based policy. How we're going to assess the safety of what we've done, uh, we will again look at the HIV rates in our donors. We will do another anonymous compliance survey to see if that has changed at all. And we will, of course, monitor the adequacy of the supply and see if there are donors that have previously been deferred who are now coming back to donate. We might get a few donors back that way. Well, Mindy, this has been a wonderful experience for me. I, I am so grateful to you for sharing sharing the thoughts. If I can refer back to the beginning of our talk, maybe sharing the thoughts of the wizard with the wand upon the throne. Um, <laughs> okay, maybe not. But to, to hear to hear your thoughts on how all this is happening and how all this has happened has been really terrific for me and I'm sure for my audience as well. So th- thank you so much for doing it. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. And I don't think the wizard analogy is a very good one, uh, because Mm -hmm. as you see, changing donor criteria uh, is a collaborative process and and not a dictatorial one. (laughs) So, uh, um, you know, maybe for Halloween, it might be not a good costume, (laughs) but I don't think that's the best way to make policy. In, in our society. So I think you're absolutely right. I do. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mindy. You take care. You're welcome. Thank you, Joe. Hi, it's Joe with just a couple of quick closing thoughts. I hope that you end our time together today with a better understanding of how blood collection organizations make difficult decisions for both donor and patient safety. And again, I am more than happy to welcome respectful discussion in the comment section at bbguy.org slash 080. I do want to mention again, this is a continuing education activity. So if you're a physician or a laboratorian, don't forget to visit wileyhealthlearning.com slash transfusion news to get your hour of totally free continuing education credit. My thanks for that as always to Transfusion News, to BioRed who brings you Transfusion News, and to Wiley Health Learning. 
My next episode is coming very soon, hopefully next week, and it will feature an interview with Dr. Rich Gammon, chair of the AABB Blood Bank and Transfusion Standards Committee. Rich and I will discuss the top 10 changes in the new 32nd edition of AABB Standards. And if that sounds exciting, it is. It's awesome. And that edition of AABB Standards, by the way, becomes effective in April 2020. Even if you don't work in an AABB accredited facility, maybe you live like I do in California. It's applicable to you whether you are AABB accredited or not, but you definitely won't want to miss that interview. But until that day, my friends, as always, I hope that you smile and have fun and above all, never, ever stop learning. Thank you so much for listening. I'll catch you next time on the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast. 